Last week we looked at just three verses um, where Jesus, remember, he had been challenging the Pharisees and, and he's challenging everybody, but some of the people are challenging him because they're like, look at the people that you hang out with, the people who are, who are drawn to your ministry, your tax collectors, they're sinners. There's got to be something wrong. He's saying, actually, there's something right here. These are the things that you should have been doing. And, and those people were coming to Christ to repent. They're convicted by the word of God. And he said, they're pressing into the kingdom. They're doing everything it need, they need to do in light of God's conviction in their heart to get right with God. And God's receiving them. And he's saying the same thing to these Pharisees who are judging Jesus and judging these people. He's saying, God will receive you too. But you need to remember that the word of God, the law and the prophets of God, will never change. The moral law of God is eternal. It's going to outlast the creation. And they had done that. And that's why he said, you guys are going through marriage relationships left and right. You're not taking the word of God seriously. And at the heart of their life, he's saying, God knows you. You esteem the value of men greater than the value of God. In other words, you care more about what people think than what God thinks. And by the way, God looks at the things that people value. He says it's an abomination to him because people value pride and self-glory. And he said, and money. He said they were lovers of money. He said, God knows what you really love. And in light of that, he tells a story about two men who had two very different lifestyles on earth, two different funerals, and then two different afterlifes. So in the following verses, Jesus now pulls back the veil that separates this world from the next world. He says, this is what's happening to the saved and to the lost. And this should give us all pause and perspective in our own life as we consider what the Lord says here. So in verse 19, Jesus says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from here from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Some of us have heard the saying, born twice, die once. Born once, die twice. What we learn here in this passage, what the Bible teaches, is that there are two different types of deaths. There's a death for the believer that opens up the way for us to go home to be with the Lord. And there's a death for the unbeliever that brings on the second death. Jesus compares and contrasts the lives of these two men. We have a rich man and we have a poor man. Let's look at their lives quickly before we move ahead into what happened afterwards because it is significant. Remember, 
The people that he was addressing here were lovers of money. They were lovers of the things of this world. And he's challenging them on it because in their mindset, they believed if I'm really wealthy, if I don't have problems like other people, like this beggar Lazarus, then I must be really blessed by God. That was the common teaching. And for a person like this beggar, who was obviously sick and had other issues in his life, there was something wrong with him. Well, so Jesus describes this man's life. He was rich. We don't know his name, but traditionally through churches, they called him Dives. I don't know if that was his name, but the word Dives literally in the Latin means rich. So, rich. Now, if you're here today and your name is Rich, this has nothing to do with you. I hope. He was clothed in purple, which is significant because that's something that was rare in those days. It was very expensive to have purple clothing. It came from a Tyrian dye from sea snails. You had to have a lot of money to wear purple. You had to be royalty or very wealthy. He had fine linen. No doubt this was Egyptian cotton. Again, very expensive. He fared sumptuously every day. He had food and beyond enough for his family, for his friends to have a feast daily. This guy would be living, according to Robin Leach, the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Remember him? But unfortunately for him, he was more like the guy in Luke chapter 12 that said, take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He didn't know that God was saying, this night your very soul is going to be required of you. It seemed that he took no notice of that poor beggar named Lazarus that was at his gate. It tells us something about this man. That he didn't really believe the word of God. As we read through the whole passage, that's something that comes up from Abraham to this man who's in Hades from Jesus to the people he's talking to about the word of God. He didn't really trust God's word. Because if he did, he would have probably cared for this, or he would have cared for this man, Lazarus. John says something very similar in the New Testament. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, poor beggar Lazarus, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? You can imagine the scene. Lazarus, whose name, by the way, means whom God has helped. Not to be confused with Jesus' friend, Lazarus, by the way. He was poor. He was sick. He was most likely crippled. He was laid at this man's gate. They had no welfare system back then. People would take you if they were your friend or your family and say, there's nothing more we could do. Let's bring him either to the streets to beg for alms or this rich man who has enough to give this man something to eat and hopefully he'll care for him. He had a life of suffering. The bread that he desired to eat, he desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Back then, that bread would be used like a napkin. Today, We have so many disposable things. You just rip through paper towels left and right, right? They didn't have those things. So if you were wealthy enough, you had enough bread. And if you had enough bread, when you were done, you just kind of wipe your face and wipe your hands like a napkin. You throw it to the dogs. So he was so hungry, he was willing to eat the bread that the man wiped his face with and his hands with. Says he desired it, but he didn't get any. And on top of that, the dogs licked his sores. He was sick. He was weak. People would look at him and say he's abandoned by God. That was the mindset. Much like when Job was sick and weak, they thought God had judged him. The guy's thinking he's taking up space by my gate, ruining my landscape. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. These weren't your friendly dogs like a household puppy. These were your street dogs. They roam the streets looking for food. In other words, he's vulnerable. He can't even move and they're licking the festering wounds on his body. The rich man knew the Torah. He knew the word of God. He was probably orthodox in his theology. He was definitely a son of Abraham. He even knew that after his death, there would be judgment. 
to separate the righteous and the unrighteous. But there is something wrong with him because he thought that he was righteous and God would bring judgment on this man's life. Opposite Lazarus, looking like he was cast off from God, would have a very different burial and a very different afterlife. So here's what would happen. In a, in a burial like a Lazarus, <coughs> who's poor, if he had no money, they would take his body and throw him in the dump. That dump would be in the valley of the son of Hinnom, Gehenna. That was the place that Jesus referred to when he tried to make reference to hell. He talks about the lake of fire, hell. They understood it was that place where things were burned. There was a constant fire. So if, if you were a thief, uh, some of the people who are crucified, get rid of the body or a poor person, just, just dump it. So if you looked at them, miserable life, miserable burial. The rich man who died would have a glorious send-off. He would have many people, friends, relatives, possibly even a hewed-out sepulcher from stone, like Joseph of Arimathea. You had to have a lot of money for something like that. We're going to give him a great burial. Everybody's going to speak well of you and eulogize you, believing that he's in it with God now. But we see the reality afterwards is reversed. Jesus tells us as he pulls back the veil between this life and the afterlife that there are two very different eternal worlds that these two men were living in. First, we're reminded that death is not the end of existence, but the beginning of an eternal new existence in one of two worlds, and they are permanent. For the believer, like in the case of this Lazarus, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul would say, actually, I'd rather be with the Lord. It's far better to be with the Lord if I depart. As for the believer, for the unbeliever, for the Christ rejecter, there's eternal separation from God and eternal judgment, torment, and punishment. And that is what's put before us this morning. The rich man was no longer rich. He's now in agony in a place called Hades. Lazarus, who was sick and suffering, is now comforted in a place called Abraham's bosom. What was Hades? Where was Abraham's bosom? Some of us have these questions, right? What's going on here in this passage? How do I make sense of this? Well, Hades was known to be a temporary place for the lost people who died until the final judgment. Abraham's bosom, and in this passage here, would be the place of temporary comfort until the way was made directly into the presence of God when Christ died on the cross for our sins. The day that that thief on the cross died, remember? He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. Before that time, a believer, a true child of God, when they died, they would live on in this place. Where was Abraham? Abraham was with all the other believers from Noah all the way down to Enoch, all the way up to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those who believe in this place of comfort. He was by his side, a place of honor, a place of rest. The rich man was in a place of torment. Now, in the New Testament, I'll just read this to you so we understand the full context of what's going to happen. John goes on and speaks about what happens to Hades and Gehenna in the final judgment. He says in Revelation chapter 20, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. 
The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death, that is the grave, and Hades, there's our word, delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Taken together, This place, Hades, where this man, this rich man, dives in his soul, apart from his body, his body's in the grave, his soul is in this place. At the final judgment, that place, Hades, will give up the soul. His body will be resurrected. He'll stand before God and be cast into hell, which is the lake of fire. That is the final place for those who are damned. Likewise, there'll be a future resurrection for the saved, where the, where the soul that's in paradise will be reunited with a glorified body to be with God forever. This is what the Bible teaches. What we learn here is there's no such thing as annihilation. Well, you guys have heard of the doctrine of annihilation. Some people think, well, I believe in heaven, and I believe there's judgment, but God would never really Damn a soul to hell in torment forever, consciously. That, so they believe, well, he annihilates them. They're just, they just don't exist anymore. Well, the problem with that is, that's not what the Bible teaches anywhere. As a matter of fact, what we read here is a very clear description, is that they are very much alive and awake and feeling and thinking and conscious and remembering, and requesting, even begging, I would even carefully say praying. There's no such thing as soul sleep. You know, some people say, well, when you die, the soul sleeps, and then there's a resurrection. The Bible doesn't talk about that at all. Again, here Jesus says, one person dies, his spirit is carried by the angels to God. Another person dies, he opens up his eyes in torment. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So both those deep teachings are false. For the person in Hades, there is agony. He uses the word torment. Being in torments. Lord, I'm in a flame. He's thirsting from this torment and from this flame. It is very real. He thinks, he feels, he sees, he remembers, he asks. This is the reality that Jesus is showing us it takes place for the lost. No matter what the funeral looks like, no matter what is said at that funeral, I'm sure that this man had a rabbi there saying, brother dives was blessed by God. We'll see him in heaven. In reality, you will not see him in heaven. And those listening to that message may even think, I'll see my brother in heaven. He's saying something very different here. First, we see that he cries out to Abraham. Abraham, in this story, responds to him. No. Abraham, verse 24, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. Oh, the rules are reversed now. Lazarus would be desiring to eat the crumbs from his table. Now he's begging, send that man that I would never be associated with, that I wish was removed from my property, just to dip his finger in some cold water to cool my tongue in this flame. The answer is no. The reason is there's a great goal fixed between us. Even if we wanted to come there, we cannot. And even if you want to come here, you cannot. It's irreversible is the idea. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 tells us that it is appointed unto man to die once and after this is the judgment. He died in his sins. He died unrepentant. He died unchanged. And here's the thing. He still hadn't changed. He's desiring for mercy. But listen to what he says. Send Lazarus. In other words, tell him to come here and serve me. 
It's still the same. Can a person repent when they step into eternity? The answer is no. How they die is how they will remain eternally. But he does have a concern about his five brothers. There are people who think, you know what? I don't want to go to heaven. And if I die, I go to, I go to hell. I'm going to be there with my friends. Right on. No, not right on. It's foolish. There's no party. There's no fellowship in hell where people are at least there with each other forever, separated from God. No. Listen to the concern of this man who is in torment. Send them to my father's house. I have five brothers that he may testify them, lest they also come to this place of torment. I don't want them here. So what does this tell us about people who have died? They are aware. They remember. They don't want other people there with them. Though they're not repentant, they do have concern for family or for friends. And Abe's response is this. Again, no. But wait a second. If you send Lazarus, send Lazarus again, and he'll convince them. If they see somebody risen from the dead, then of course they're going to repent. And he says, no. They have the word of God. They have Moses. They have the prophets. If they're not persuaded by the word of God, they won't be persuaded by that sign, by that miracle. Now, no doubt, when people were listening to this, they'd be shocked. You're telling me that the guy that we think would be going to heaven is in hell, and the guy that we think that would probably go to hell is in heaven? And Jesus is saying, that's right. Shocked. There will be many, many people who are shocked. When they die, who will be lost? C.S. Lewis tells the story of of a man who walked by a tombstone, and somebody wrote on it, here lies an atheist all dressed up and nowhere to go. And somebody else wrote how he wishes that were so. Because you can say, well, I don't really believe he's there. Therefore, it's not going to affect me. That doesn't mean God's not there. The first man to go into space was a Russian cosmonaut. Khrushchev, who was the Russian leader at that time, said, well, he went out into space and he didn't see God. And then somebody said, well, if he stepped out of his space suit, he would. <laughs> That's the greater reality. Everybody who's on the other side now knows the truth. And if they could have it reversed, they would, but it's irreversible. And if they could have their family, their friends who don't believe this, believe this, they would... They would have that be the case. Please don't let them have it. We have the testimony here. Shocked. Lewis went on and said this in his book, The Weight of Glory. He made an astounding point. Because it's not just the loss, it's the saved. If you looked at this guy, Lazarus, you wouldn't want to spend time with, well, not you. This man wouldn't want to spend time with this person. He was just, you know, a foul creature judged by God. I didn't even want him at my gate. God sees things very differently. Lewis says this, the dullest and the most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature, which if you saw it now, you'd be strongly tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. There are no ordinary people. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. What is he saying? Every believer to trust God, whatever they look like, have or have not, that person will be so magnificently glorified at the resurrection that if you saw that person now, like John was tempted to worship that angel in Revelation, the angel said, don't do it. You'd be, like, you'd be so overwhelmed. You may want to worship them, though they're not God. That's what's ahead for the believer. And so he says, just remember, when you're talking to any human being about the potential that they have, how ordinary or dull they may be, God will take that person, and if they're saved, will bring everlasting glory to them. If they are not saved, no matter what they look like or have here, you may, they might attract you to them. 
You may value in them. If they are lost, it will be an everlasting nightmare. Learn how to value and judge and see as God sees, not as man sees. And that's what he was saying to the Pharisees. You esteem the things that man esteems. It's an abomination to God. Here's the word of God. I'm telling you the truth. Why does he say this to us? The same reason he was saying it to them. He wants us prepared. He wants to warn us. He wants to make us aware. Because many of us today had the same problem they did then, unbelief in God's word. If you were to run stats, and and just in our country, in America, people do this. They take polls about their belief in the afterlife. So when you get to stats and polls, you got to be careful that it's not an exact science, but it can be pretty close. So here's some recent statistics. Among Americans, most people, over 65%, still believe that there's a heaven. Okay, now, does it mean they agree with the same idea as what the Bible teaches, but they have some idea that there's a heaven in the afterlife? Many of, many of them would also say that there's a place called hell. Again, they may disagree with what that means, but there's a general belief that there's a heaven and there's a place of punishment for bad, really, 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 but you've got to be really bad. Among Protestants, the large majority of Protestants, Bible-believing, or they say they hold to the Bible, believe that heaven is real. I hope so, 87%. All right, they believe that there's a heaven and hell because it, you, know, you look at the Scripture. But then even then, among Catholics, 66%. Among mainline, mainline Protestants, just people who claim to be a Christian, claim not to be Catholic, but they, you know, they don't really... And the Bible's myth, and they take this, they cut that part out, and they still believe that there's a place called hell. But really, really, really bad people go there, about 55% of them. Here's what we need to remember. Don't go by what statistics, what people say, even the majority. It's what Jesus says here. Jesus is affirming that heaven is real, that hell is real, that they are eternal, there's an afterlife, and he wants us to know that that should be our priority in this life. Because this life will be wrapped up very quickly here. We all know, especially the older you get. I'm 51 years old. I don't know how many, people say, you got to admit you're through midlife. How many 102-year-olds do I know? So how long do I really have left, really, compared to eternity? Eternity is fixed and set. And that poor beggar was in Abraham's bosom and comfort for eternity. This rich man's eternity was set. And what he had on earth was very short-lived. So for the saved, God wants us to know this. And here's the good news. It's a place of comfort, a place of honor, a place of fellowship, a place of joy, a place of rest. We are with Jesus. He wants the believer to look forward to this. He wants us to know that it's better there than it is here. Again, Paul said it's far better to depart and be with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, I was caught up to paradise. I saw things. I heard things that were so glorious that if I even tried to write it down, it would do it injustice. It'd be unlawful for me to do it, so I'm not going to do it. But what did he say? I didn't know if I was in my body or if it was in my spirit. In other words, when he was taken out of his body to heaven, God gave him a special revelation. He said, it wasn't like I was floating around and I'm kind of like vaporized through things and it was boring. It was like a dream. He said, it was so real, I couldn't tell if I was in my body. This rich man feels, thinks, sees. Conscious. This poor man feels, thinks, sees. Conscious. If you were to die today as a believer, you would be blessed. You would be comforted. You would not want to come back here. If somebody was praying, oh, bring back brother so-and-so, you'd be like, please don't answer that prayer, Lord. I don't want to go back there. I want to be with you. And that's what Jesus has for us. And he wants us to also know how to get there. Okay, so we get there 
the same way Lazarus got there. How did this poor guy get there? By faith. By trusting God. His name means God has helped him. In other words, here's a guy laying at the gate. Poor, sores all over him, but he trusted God. He believed God's word. So we don't mess this up. Because some people think, well, the poor people go to heaven and the rich people go to hell, right? That's not it. Poverty doesn't save you. There are very wicked, selfish, covetous, poor people. And there are very loving, God-trusting, believing, generous, rich people who are saved. It's whether you trust Christ or not by having faith in his word. I'm looking forward to this. Now, I, I've never died before, so I'm not looking forward to death itself. But I'm looking forward to the other side because Jesus says some really comforting things. I go to prepare a place for you. Don't let your heart be troubled. He doesn't want the Christian shaken. Oh, no, what's going to happen to me? Is he going to, is he going to cast me off? Because some believers are like that. You're saved one day. You're not saved the next day. You have a really good saved week, and then you have two bad weeks, so you're not saved. And you come to church, you got to get saved again. And then you're lost. You just never know. God wants you stabilized in your faith. Jesus told his disciples, don't let your heart be troubled. You trust in God, trust in me. It's not rocket science. You trust me. You love me. You trust me. You follow me. You're mine. I'm yours. I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you. And what I have there is going to knock your eternal socks off, if you have socks there. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to come and receive you to myself. So here's how I see it. He's showing up. Angels are showing up. Heaven's showing up to bring me home. I, that is what this poor guy had. He departed from his body, and his friends were there taking you home, taking you to eternity, taking you to the place that God has made for you. And here's the thing. Millions and millions and millions of believers throughout the generations have experienced this. They have died trusting in Christ. Many of them put to death by the sword, put to death by hanging, put to death by the cross, drowning, burning for Christ's sake, and on the other side, home. And sometimes they die it's that natural death that so many of us die, but they're home because Jesus will never lie to us. He can't lie. He won't lie. He's promised. And he wants us to know that we have eternal life. So if you're sitting here this morning saying, I, I, I want to be there. Sometimes I'm shaking in this. I don't want to be like that guy. Well, God knows your heart. You trust in him. You believe him. You've leaned yourself on Christ for salvation. He'll receive you to himself. But the fact is, there's good news and there's bad news. That's the good news. The bad news is there are people who will be shocked. And there will be multitudes of people when they die, when they open up their eyes, they will be in this place. And this is what Jesus is saying. So, so listen, we need to remember, the, the, the Bible's very clear about this reality because Jesus taught more on hell than he did about heaven because he wants people warned. There's torment. It's eternal. There's fire. Jesus also called it a place of outer darkness. It's solitary. There will be memory of all the opportunities that one has had here, all the people that they were with. Religious people. This guy was religious. On the outside, if you looked at him, be like, he's going to heaven. God's saying, no, they don't really trust me. See, knowledge of the word of God, having a good godly family, or a family that's just religious, or church, or a temple, doesn't save you. Even believing that God exists, or that there's one God, doesn't save us. James says, you believe that there's one God? You do well, but even the devils believe and they tremble. They know, but they don't trust him. They don't love him. This man was called a son of Abraham. Does God send men and women to hell? Does a holy, loving God send men and women to hell? The answer to that is yes. And here's why. Because they choose it. Jesus said men love darkness more than light. That's what they love. They choose their own way. 
Somebody once said, there's going to be two said, things said to people on that final day, that judgment day. To those who have said, like Jesus, your will be done. Your will be done, God. He will say to you, enter in to heaven. Enter in to the reward of the Father. Enter in to your eternal home, beloved. Because there's a submitted heart of faith to God's will being done. But to those who have said in their life, my will be done. He will say, well then, your will be done. Depart. Into everlasting darkness. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Because that's the heart of rebellion against God. As religious as somebody might be, true faith submits to God. Doesn't mean that we're perfect, we're sinless. It means that we trust Christ for our salvation. And then out of that will bring a life of repentance and Christ-likeness, and the fruit of the Holy Spirit in time. Hell was not made for man. Originally, it was made for the devil and his angels. We read that in the Bible. But those who will follow him, and by the way, the devil loves religion. He loves a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. People who follow him in his way will be in that place that was made for him. But that's not what God wants for you. That's not his desire. That's why Christ came, to save us from that. The majority of us here this morning, believers, that's why we're here. I wouldn't be standing here preaching if Christ didn't get a hold of my life. I remember when I wasn't saved. I didn't give my heart to Christ until I was 21 years old. I grew up, my parents were moral. They went to church every Sunday. There was no real spiritual life in our family. We didn't really know the Lord until a sibling got saved. And then he brought the gospel into our family, and then I got saved, and then another brother got saved, and another brother got saved. But it, it has to be you trusting in Christ. God doesn't have grandchildren. He has children. who trust in Christ. And you know that as a believer, that the reason why you have eternal life is because of him, because he's had mercy on you. God does not delight in the death of the wicked. It's not his will that men perish. That's why he sent Christ in the world, to save us from this place. So for the Christian, a couple things. It should tighten our perspective up and our priority. In other words, I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful I'm not going there. I can say to you, I actually, in myself, would deserve the judgment of God because I've sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Eternal death, eternal separation of death. I'm worthy of that, but Jesus has paid for my sins and forgiven me my sins. Everything on top of my salvation is gravy. Thank you, Lord, that I actually have food. Thank you, I have a shirt on my back. I'm saved. Thank you that I'm going to be with you. I have it better than I deserved. What am I really concerned about in this life? God's going to take care of us. He'll take care of the physical, temporal needs. He knows what we need, and he knows what we don't need. We have salvation, and we have Christ with us forever. So what are my priorities? What am I consumed with? When I see that on the other side of the grave, multitudes and multitudes of people are dying and going into a lost eternity every day, where's my heart? Every day in the United States, close to 7,000 people die every day. You go into a hospital, and I do this a lot. You visit somebody who's having a baby. That's awesome. On the floor above you, somebody's leaving this earth. Somebody's passing out cigars. Somebody's making phone calls and saying he's gone. Where are they? In the world, 150,000 people on average die, a day die. Every hour, over 6,000 people die. 
105 people a minute, two people every second die since we've had this service. How many people have gone on into eternity? Into a conscious eternity. We need to prioritize and boldly, lovingly, wisely share the gospel with people. What are we concerned about? Well, I don't want to tell them about how. I don't want to freak them out. They get mad at me. They'll get angry. Well, wait a second. This guy who's in hell is saying, please tell them about this place called hell. Please, I don't want my brothers here. What if we don't tell them the whole truth and we just tell them about the love of God? Well, the love of God, the love of God sent Jesus to die on the cross to save us from here. He paid for the wrath of God because of the love of God. It's the most loving thing to do, not to scream at a person, not to tackle them in the yard and say, you're going to die, you're lost, you, you're crazy. You know, they know you're crazy. It's to say, look, here's the truth. Here's what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you. Because the Holy Spirit will tell that person, no, it's real. And they're going to get mad at you. They might laugh at you. But we can't worry about that. They laughed at Jesus. They said, listen, I'm going to tell you what's really going on and what's really the most important thing, and you guys have missed it. Where are you going to be when you die? We get to go there because of Christ. You and I have heard the truth because somebody loved us enough and told us the truth. You might have gotten mad at that person, angry at that person, but they prayed for you, shared the gospel with you, and in time, God brought you into the kingdom. That's what we need to be doing as well. You may be sitting there saying, well, I'm not sure if it's true. I don't know if that's real. So what if I follow Jesus and I find out at the end there is no hell? Well, let me ask you a question. What if you reject the truth? Because you're not willing to take that chance. And you die and you find out it is true. And you can't change it. And you're sitting here this morning thinking, I, I've heard this before, but I'm not convinced. Well, God will convince you. If you're open to the truth, if you want to know the truth, God will speak his word to your heart, and you'll know. I need more signs. I need more proof. No, you don't. You don't. Jesus, remember this guy said, send Lazarus to my brothers. Then they'll be like, no, no. I can send Lazarus there. They still won't believe. They have the word of God. They don't believe the word of God. They won't believe even if somebody comes back from the dead. And that actually happened, right? Because a guy named Lazarus, who was dead for four days, rotting in a tomb, was called out by Jesus. Lazarus, come forth. The guy walks out. And there are some people who are like, I'm going to believe. Good choice. There are other people who said, now get rid of him. What? That's right. He raised somebody from dead. Kill him. And by the way, get rid of that guy, Lazarus, too. He's probably thinking, what did I do? I just died. He called me out of my grave. And now you want to get rid of me? Get rid of the evidence. Because when people don't want to believe, no amount of evidence is going to convince them. John said, even though he did so many miracles, so many signs, they still wouldn't believe. I've done too many bad things. He can't forgive me. He can forgive you. He will forgive you of every type of sin. No, you don't know what I did. Well, maybe I don't, but he does. When Christ died on the cross, he took the payment, he made the payment and took the punishment for every sin, every deed, every evil thought, every crime in his own body, in his own soul, and paid for it and was judged by God, therefore. He was run over by the truck of God's wrath so that when you die by trusting in him, you get to pass through the valley of the shadow of death. He paid for it all. And he said the only sin that will stop you from going to heaven that won't be forgiven is if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. 
I said, well, what's that? Well, the Holy Spirit is the one who takes his word and says, this is true. Flee to Christ. Turn from your sin. Go to him. He'll wash you with his own blood. He'll, he'll remove all of your sins. He will. He's promised. He'll forgive you. And then you're his. You come with him. If you, if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit, you're blaspheming him. You can't be forgiven because you're not coming to Christ. God will forgive you. God has shown you his love. God doesn't want you to go there. God himself became flesh, and his flesh is the veil that was torn on the cross so that you go through him to the Father and go to eternal life with him. That is the most important thing, and he will take anybody that will come to him, anybody, a thief on the cross who was mocking him and railing on him right before he died and said, this man's done nothing wrong. I deserve to be here. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. He wins. Every time a soul turns to him, God gets a victory. And that man, that thief on the cross, will have a glorified body forever and be with Christ. The other guy who's next to Christ died rejecting him. What will it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Jesus asked that question. How long are you going to have it for? You can't keep it. Your soul is eternal and valuable to God. And he puts a premium on it. He says, I love you and I gave my son for you on that cross. I want you forgiven. I want you with me forever. It's your choice. Turn to him. There is joy in the presence of the angels in heaven when one sinner turns. If you're backslidden today and you're thinking, you know what? I, I got to get my priorities straight. I've, I've walked away from the Lord. I know I'm going to get back on track. God will wash you and forgive you. If we're believers and we're just kind of like, you know what? I'm, I'm getting a little too comfy here. I'm getting too concerned with the things of this world, the ways of man, and, and I've lost focus. Let this sharpen our focus. This is the greater reality. Let's be, let's be bold. Let's tell people the truth. Let's not be afraid of offending or losing a position or a relationship. Let God be God. Lovingly tell people the truth about Christ and let him bring people into the kingdom. And if you don't know, if you're like, you know, I don't know. I don't want to be there. Good. <clears throat> Come to Christ. Now. Give your life to him and he will receive you into eternal life. There is nothing more important than that. And God is good. He cannot lie. He tells us the truth. He's promised eternal life to all those who put their trust in his son. You have the word of God. Put your trust in him. Let's stand close with a word of prayer.